recognize this? It looks like an engine. It looks like a Jeep engine. Doing a little of a uh, research on this thing. So, yeah, this is the, uh, not the CJ2 engine. This is the L head or is it F head? I don't know. Whatever it is, the overhead valve engine. And I just thought we should delve into it. And, you know, this thing came out of somebody's backyard, ran great when parked. So I started taking it apart and found out a few things. But first, I want to ask you, do you even know how an internal combustion engine works? No. Like, do you have any idea what goes on inside here? Mm -mm. It's pretty fascinating. That's why I kind of put you pieced it back together because you saw it and it looked like this. But look, all most of the guts are out. So, how, like, if you saw this big block of iron or whatever, cast something, how, how would you think that it makes power out of just pouring gasoline and oil and water in it sparks does make sparks pressure there's pressure there's a fan there yep <laughs> so it's like an airplane so this thing just kind of pulls the car around through air pressure mm -hmm. no that's not true at all this cools the water in the radiator. <laughs> so this is the water pump let's get there first so i have really have no idea oh well the engine while it's turning is going to turn this pulley and in turn, it turns these little deals inside. So that pushes the water through all the internals of the engine. These are the engine cylinders in here. The valve cover covers, what are they? If it's a valve cover, what's it covering? Valves. Valves. Right. <laughs> so Sorry, I'm a little slow today. I'm tired. This is unique. I haven't, I mean, it might be a common thing, but I have not seen an engine. Usually when you open a V8, there's like, twice as many valves. So this has valves in the head and then it has valves in the block. It's kind of a mutant. There's a flathead engine which has all the valves in the block pointing up. These valves point both up and down, which is cool. So the intake comes in here and the exhaust goes right out through these valves. Hmm. Yes, yeah, cool setup. I pulled this apart Chris, who we got it from, pulled it apart too, and he's like, water got in there. Water got in here. It's cleaned up right now. Is that bad? Pretty bad. But I may have mediated it, and I may have not. That's where your call is what counts here. So you never seen the inside of an engine? No. Well, look inside. Any questions? Looks like cup holders. That's exactly what they are. I love how you said cup holder. <laughs> it does. It looks like a cup holder. Or a can holder. Mm -hmm. What? Oh, wow. Can you dig it? I see. You were watching all that stuff in Germany with the animatronics? Uh-huh. Look at that there. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was like, what am I looking at? I put that cover back on. Wow. So can you see what's going on? Can you even come up with a theory as to what's happening here? It's creating pressure. <clears throat> it is. So you're only seeing half the action. This is the exhaust valve. So as this turns, there's a push rod here. So it's pushing that valve. As it turns, this valve opens. See this? Watch. It's pulling in. It's breathing. Ah. Right? And then this one, as it comes up, it's exhausting. Kind of like for a heart. Yes. Huh? Yeah. yeah. So that's what these are doing. So this pulls in. It pulls in the fuel and air into here as it's pulling down and then it's coming up right and it's creating tremendous pressure and at that point the spark hits it and boom blows it all the way back down and then that opens and on this stroke shoots it out of the exhaust wow right <laughs> That's some witchcraft right there. And that's right. the principle for just about every internal combustion engine. There's all different shapes and sizes, and some that spin like a rotary engine. But 
Ooh, that's a mouthful. <laughs> I learned this on a little one horsepower go kart engine. I mean, a one cylinder, five horsepower go kart engine. And I was hooked. My friend showed me that exactly in his basement. He went, I went. <laughs> I bet. And it never stopped from there. Check out this engine stand. I know people in low places. I've had that thing for about five years, four or five years now. I'm gonna give you one guess and you're never gonna get it. Who did I get this engine stand from? Your mom. Nope. Little Daddy Roth. Aww. Thanks, Dennis. Yeah, when I moved I in. I would have never guessed that. <laughs> yeah, when I moved in, uh, actually, this was in our shop in Van Nuys. He's like, hey, I got this engine hoist in the back of the car. Do you want it? I was like, I don't mess with the engines. Come on, I don't want it. All right, so I threw it in the corner and finally messed with the engine. Here it is. So, yeah, you know, everybody gets a little something. So this is what happens on the underside. Dig that. So, what's happening in here? is the bottom end is what it's called. So that's the top end and the bottom end is all of these little, they're like little holders that hold bearings. So I don't even really remember the name of it because I'm not an engine guy. I'm sure we're gonna get a lot of comments, but it's called a connecting rod. It's kind of like a bone, look in there. I'm gonna turn a little bit. So the connecting rod connects the piston to the crankshaft. So see, that's what's happening. These things are pushing and pulling on the pistons. Mm. And all the while, it's turning an oil pump, which pressurizes the oil through all these bearings. It's turning a water pump. It's making a fuel pump go tick, 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 tick. It's moving valves. It's turning the clutch, which turns the transmission, which turns the drive line into the axles, into the tires, and then you drive. So this is the thing. You can see this looks pretty technical, does it not? Yes. So my question after opening this is, how big do you want to go with this Jeep? Because at this point, a full rebuild is, uh, you're right there. It's just going to be money. In other words, to pull this apart, get into the bottom end, check all the bearings, the clearances, yada, yada, yada. Or, I don't see any rust in here. I don't see any like foam. Sometimes the oil get white if it was running and mm -hmm. leaking from the cylinder head. I don't see any terrible corrosion. He said water got in here. And the only thing that I see is just a little bit of a rust ring in this cylinder. The, the intake valve was open and it must have rained on the carburetor and it went in. So see how perfectly polished and smooth mm -hmm. this is? This one's got a little action. It's not smooth. I can feel it. And the pistons come all the way up to seemingly almost completely to the top. So there's rings in there surrounding the piston that are like, that's the seal you're feeling. So if these aren't making perfect contact, then this, the compression in this cylinder will probably be low. It may blow oil out. It may backfire. There's a lot of stuff that could happen. And then these valves, these all seat perfectly too. To be perfect seals. So what are my choices? Go for a complete rebuild. This would be considered like the long block, right? Because there's no head on it. So mm -hmm. it's top end, bottom ends, half and half, I guess, because the top end is over there too. But that's a machine shop money. Okay. Potentially big money. If you got to replace a lot of stuff. Or you can reseal it, fire it up, and see what happens. <laughs> I know what I do. The other pro and con is if you do choose to just seal this up, put a little coat of paint on it, and move forward, then we can mate it with the transmission and mock it up in the Jeep tomorrow. Otherwise, it goes for, to the machine shop for an indeterminate amount of time. Of course, I want to seal it up and see what happens. You know, I live on the edge, just like you. Looking at this, it's going to run. It's going to run. Uh, I'm not hearing any kind of like, I've had other VW engines where you do this, and you hear like tick, 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 like there's a lot of play in maybe the, in the uh, connecting rod bearings. It seems like it's reasonably decent. Uh, if it smokes, big freaking deal. It'll run, right? And then, okay, 
down the line, the Jeep's complete, you've messed around with it a little bit, you leave this engine in there, pull it head off, hone it, re-ring it, put it back together. If it's knocking and clanging and alarms are going off, then you gotta pull the whole engine, but it's a pretty simple procedure, so. You still feeling that way? Mm-hmm. Well, yep. let's talk about the bell housing and transmission then. Check this out. You're going to love this. Now that you've committed to my course of action, <laughs> take a look in there. Wow. What is that? Goo? <laughs> that is some very old oil. Is that a good thing? No. So I don't see any metal in this. Sometimes you'll see metal shavings, but this is definitely old oil. So Look. what do you do to clean that? Well, I'll just scrape it out and then clean this with a, you know, with a solvent. So I'm just saying that's the sign that the engine was probably neglected for a long time. Was it raced? Was it over revved? Was it like totally abused? Probably not. It was probably more like a workhorse and they just never changed the oil. So. It could have sat with that oil in there for 30 years. I don't know, but I did drain the oil and it was okay, it was very black, but it wasn't like, yeah. And then when you took that off, then you saw that. Yeah, yeah. So this goes under all those at the bottom of the engine. That's the oil pan. Okay. So, yeah, that's the thing. And looking at the head, doesn't look terrible. Uh, I've seen. You know, a lot of weird stuff inside here. Not a ton of carbon. See that? Sometimes you'll get really big fills up of carbon in the engine. But nothing like too out of control. So, yeah, my bet is it's going to run. We'll find out. There's a lot of pine needles in there, too. Oh, my. <laughs> like I said, I cleaned it up. But uh, let's hook this up to the engine hoist, and we'll get into the transmission. And bell housing. So this is the transmission and bell housing. Everything is kind of really wide open right now. One really cool thing that has uh, developed is we're going to work with Summit Racing uh, on this project. They have a whole catalog devoted to early Jeep parts and all the things that we're going to need. New clutch disc, that output shaft engage it properly like it's supposed to the clutch the pressure plate throw out bearing all the business we have a distributor with electronic ignition starter and then we got uh, a few other things that are on the way too. the fuel pump engine mounts i mean it's a whole thing it's all from this company that uh, is specializing in Jeep stuff. Where's the box? It's uh, Crown. Crown's a popular supplier, I guess. And uh, yeah, we got a whole bunch of stuff coming. So that's what I was getting at. It's like, well, we're going to have all new accessories. And I've done this a lot in the past. I know it's starting to turn into a talk show. We don't have a lot of work to do today. What is but... this, a talk show? <laughs> but that's where we're at. So uh, this bell housing fits the engine block. Transmission case. There's still a piece in it, but uh, we got all the new bearings and everything. So, yeah, we can bolt this to that. It'll go right back on the transfer case, and we can put our engine mounts in because we got all that. Just going to hook this up to the hoist, throw it on the table, put the bell housing on. And engine work isn't like, to me, it's not exciting. It's just very uh, parts changing. I mean, if you're into racing and exotic stuff like that, then it's more art, especially top fuel drag racing. But... Um, in this aspect of it, it's just parts changing, and there's some there's some issues with the bearing clearances that I'm just not comfortable getting into. Where you put like this little like almost it's like it's like a plasti gauge. It's like a little plastic ribbon that you compress inside the bearings, and I'm not familiar with that business at all. So if I'm not familiar or comfortable with that business, then I'm not getting into it. Put a chain on this engine and lock it up in the Jeep. <laughs> There's a couple broken studs in here too. That's a bummer, but we'll, we'll repair that. That's not a hard one in this condition. And then the thing that holds the uh, distributor in place, that one's broken too. But if you mess around with engines, you know it's part of the drill. 
you might ask, why would there be a broken stud on the engine block, Ian? <laughs> well, I was kind of wondering that. How do things like that get broken? Rust. Oh. Or somebody tightened it too much. Have you even ever seen one of these things? Um, I think so. Pretty cool setup. So these things are all posable. They slide around for different engines, which is neat. In my very first DVD, there's a whole segment where I was like, I hate it. <laughs> hate everything that happens inside of an engine because <laughs> it's, uh, it's a little bit of witchcraft yeah i mean i've seen with persephone what we've gone through with that and, and that was just an engine change yeah. yeah her brakes and the whole nine so the same principle is in the brake master cylinder this compression thing so you're pushing a, a rod and a piston in the brake mm. master cylinder this is filled with fluid in that, so it pushes pressure through the fluid. The whole master and servant arrangement. Grooving. That ain't gonna fall over, is it? I hope not. Cast iron is gonna be just a okay. So as you can imagine. Engines take up a lot of space when they're disassembled. I see that. I'm going to have to catalog, index, cross-reference, everything. This plugs right onto that engine. Once you get one bolt started, it tends to assemble a bit easier. It's all about getting the first little thing in there. Voila. So see, this is what I was getting at. As soon as I tighten this nut, this whole assembly is ready to go in the Jeep. So it's not a lot better than taking it all apart and bringing it to the machine shop and waiting for months on end. Yes. I thought you might see it my way. Please get along so agreeably. All right. I'm going to wait till tomorrow and then get these cars out of the way and bring that Jeep in. Or maybe I'll do it this afternoon and we'll film tomorrow. But there you have it. This is what it looks like. Assembled, I mean, you have a stick shift coming out of here, you have a carburetor and an exhaust and all kinds of other stuff, but this is enough to mock it up in there because you have your rear mounts and your front mounts. Ah, okay. So yeah, and then we'll be able to stack the head on, uh, put the intake and the carburetor on just to see how high up through the hood it comes. So talk about excitement. So day two, and what's going on? Day two, you can see I shaved, got a new hat, and there's something else exciting too. I wanna know. Well, we talked about Summit racing, right? Got another surprise, proving it's day two. Went to the mailbox this morning and dropped off another box. Drum roll, please. What is that? <laughs> what is that? I don't know. What is it? It looks like a box of some sort. Oh, I know what it is. What is it now? Is it a gas tank? It is a gas tank. <laughs> and I see your Schwartz is as big as mine. <laughs> wow. Look at that. Wow. Oh, cool. Out with the old. In with the new. Oh, wow. Thank you, Summit Racing. Now we need a cap, a fuel gauge center, and a fitting for the output. Oh, my gosh. That'll make some cool yard art. Don't get rid of it. Oh, yeah. You can hear all the dirt. It's rusted, look, rusted and dirt inside. So that will give you a fresh fuel supply. Exciting. But that's not what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about putting this engine in. It had the Toyota 
engine swap, so all the mounts have been removed to fit this style engine. So fortunately, the transmission, if you look way down in there, see those two little studs poking up all the way at the cross member? Right there? Right there. The cross member is. Yeah. Well, they index on these right here. So that is stock, and that's why we know that's where it goes back in place. Oh, okay, that makes sense. And voila. So, we know that's the spot. And what I was thinking, we have the opportunity to move this engine kind of anywhere now. We're not going to be doing a lot of four wheeling, so the articulation of the axle isn't going to get crazy important in regards to the U joint maybe hitting the oil pan. So I think we could probably just give that just a little bit down. I don't know. I got a little shim under the body here just to get the transmission in, but that sits like that. Just a little bit. I feel like this Jeep is really happy. You'll know it when it starts purring. <laughs> okay, so that's way low. I'm just going to put a level on this just to take a look. So we got our stock tire size. There's no rake like you would see in a hot rod with big tires in the back. So I'm going to put that right there on the engine lock. And see that little bubble? Mm -hmm. We're going to raise it till that bubble is even. See right there, that's about level. Maybe just a touch more. Right there, huh? Looks it. Yeah, and again, it's not a perfect world, but see there's plenty of room behind the engine that won't hit the firewall. So again, this thing's custom. We're going to build these mounts. As long as that crankshaft is centered in the frame rails, we're gonna do whatever it takes. So uh, these came from Summit as well. Thank Simple you, little rubber dealy. They go right there. And we build something to attach to the chassis. So there's one on each side. And the rear one, we have a brand new one, but that one's in perfect usable order for the mock-up. So we're just gonna leave it. See, I can have it. If I could find a nut, we could get on with the show. All right, these are pretty big studs coming off of this, so I just found a couple lug nuts. It happened to match that thread pitch, so I'm imagining it's like half inch fine thread. So we're just going to put them on upside down to hold it temporary. There it goes. Cool. I'm going to measure that crankshaft. That's that thing sticking out of the center with the big nut on it. So from that chassis, Look to the center of that, it's about 12 and a half. And we'll go out. Oh, yeah. That's 13 and a half, so we got to go to 13. That's my lucky number. 13 there? Yeah, 13. That means it's 26 on the inside of the chassis. Look at that, it's 26 on the inside of the chassis. Well, that's our number, folks. 13. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. This was bent, so I had to heat it up with the torch. And when I bent it back into shape, this caught on fire. What happened? This gear, it's not steel. It's some kind of fibrous plastic. Because I was over here with the torch heating it up, and that thing they caught on fire. So we might have to get a new gear. It didn't really turn the charcoal or anything, but it was definitely smoking. Mm -hmm. well, that's news. Don't go lighting your camshaft gear on fire, y'all. All right, I'm going to put a little strap to hold that at 13. We're going to build one at a time. Here's today's question. What's a camshaft? You. You with the phone there. You're first. Um, it's the thing that turns the gears to make the... Transmission run? Incorrect. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. It's the thing, sometimes called a bump stick. It has lobes on it. 
these little valves go up and down. Mm -hmm. The camshaft has a series of bumps on it, and it causes it to rise up. So it's a, uh, yeah. In short, it makes the valves go up and down. Also turns the distributor and the fuel pump, but that's outside of our scope of conversation for the moment. So I'm gonna wrench this right over to 13. More click, we're there. Sweet. 13, 13, I'm gonna build that side. We're gonna use the old cardboard envisioning technique. We have a surface right here. Can you dig it? Mm hmm Well, you can dig it the most. Then we have this, right? Mm -hmm. So we only need this to come up about that much. So I'm going to take my marker. I just bit that in half. Savage. I'm going to make a little shape like that. Then we want this to come out, let's say, three inches. So, right, we have that. It's not really square, I'm just going to eyeball it. And then we want it three inches longer that way. Now, I think I got some flat stock over here. I do, this is kind of thin, it's eighth inch, but fits that just about perfect. And then I have some heavier material here, and I have some of the same. I got a lot of the same. Look at that. I think that just made our decision. We want this plus three. Get my glare. There it is. All right, cool. So we'll just chop this off. And I got this cool bender that I never used that we're going to use. Cut this. So I'll just keeps cutting. 18 years into the game, never lubed it once. So I got my mark. What is this thing? Um, plate bender. Oh. Woodward Babs, it's a little dusty. It's been with me for some years. So when you tighten this, see this little guy? Mm -hmm. When you tighten this, it pulls it in. See how it's pulling it in? Oh. It's sort of a press brake, but it pulls. So you put your little marks on that. Uh-oh. Now watch. All right. Now I'm going to get this piece of template rod. I'm going to figure out on the Jeep, right? So we have our mount here. We're going to figure out what our angle wants to be. Pretty much like that. Give or take. Now I could just as well put this in the vise and bang it with a big hammer. That's not out of the question either if you don't have this, but I have it. Now, it does spring back a little bit, but I'm just going to test. Yeah, that's what we want. Right there. Cool. Before we get in too deep, I'm going to uh, use the Sharpie and just mark this and drill it. So I'm leaving it up back here because I want this to be very simple, uh, but I also want it to be able to put a nut on from the back. So what I'm getting at is that, see if I lower it to make this flush, it's going to get out of shape. And I'm going to gusset the back of this anyway. So I'm just going to let it be sort of a generic on top fit up. Yeah. You know what I'm going to do just to please everyone? I'm going to use the drill press that I never use. I think secretly, I think secretly you're using it because you want to use it. Definitely, it's always that. Yeah, we might go through the dull drill bit shuffle. 
somebody said, get a drill doctor or sharpen it by hand. But these are the cheapy drills that you get from the corner store. So they don't really sharpen well. They were the black drill bits. Whatever the machine, steel, whatever it is. You could sharpen them, but these are throwaways. All right. Another guy said, no drill press vice, no center punch. What kind of hack is this? Well, like Bill Murray said, I think it was Bill Murray. Somebody said, what kind of clown are you? A juggling clown, sir? <laughs> I'm a juggling clown. Sweet. I got to say, that was incredibly satisfying to watch. <laughs> they make a tool for every job. One of those. One of those. Cool. So I'm going to tack this in place after checking the 13 inch again. Do the same the other side. One last check on things. We're going at 13. And this is still level. I know the Jeep itself may not be level. All you critics, this is the baseline. We could always put a little washer in there. It's not going to, the Jeep is made to run practically upside down. If the engine's a little degree off, <laughs> it's not going to matter. <laughs> you said it's made to run upside down. <laughs> I mean, if they're coming for you, right, this thing's got to run. It's a war machine. That's a heck of a tack mm -hmm. that I committed. Same operation on the other side. But now I can release that because it's not going to shift over. He said as he released it and it shifted over. Nope. We got the same giddy up over here. Look at that. Pretty darn symmetrical. Make one more of the same. So we might have to cut this because I noticed it was a smidge different than three inches. Oh, we're going to do that. Let's make it look professional. <laughs> Not bad for freehand though, huh? Mm -hmm. yeah. I've drawn some lines. Yeah, I high, highly recommend getting one of these saws if you're doing any kind of work that you want to just be timely with. Those chop saws, big abrasive blades, I do not like them. We got that squared. Again, this is a Woodward Fab tool. I've had it for many years, but uh, we probably still stock them. Works just great. All right, let's see how that bend looks. Just fine. See, that's what I was saying, just a little bit big. That's cool. We're gonna cut that right here. This isn't the most exotic fabrication, but you're just trying to do an engine swap on something and you don't know how that is done. This is basically an engine swap because it had the Toyota in it, no engine mount. So this information transfers to anything with a chassis like this, which is pretty much most hot rods and customs. If you're putting in a 350 Chevy V8, the most common one, same thing applies, different shaped mounts, but you're going to grab the chassis. A lot of people put them on the inside, but I saw on the Toyota that was set up and on the original engine mounts, they actually straddle the outside. So I think that's what these big rivets are for. So again, not a restoration, but trying to keep a little of the flow. Hit that one with the welder.
funny. We were watching some TV show last night with a guy who looked just like me. He was making really ugly welds. <laughs> and I never wore my glasses until just recently. And I was like, you couldn't see what you're doing, man. It was so, you. You were the one that was making ugly welds. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, I was just always in such a rush and just like, you know, sweating and hot. And it's another accessory. And I was like, just put it together. And when I see it on TV close up, it's like, oof. I mean, it holds, but they were ugly. I didn't. Really Want to know another thing I realized through the help of some very sage advice? Yes. Wear a belt when you bend over. <laughs> I really try to edit the crack out, but, you know. Crack is whack. So see what I'm doing here? I'm going to trace this. I'm going to put this right down. Probably better. Let me cut this out. You can really see it. I'm paying attention to the entire width of the chassis. So that cardboard is going to set right down with the last finger, like that. I'm going to come from behind with the marker, trace it, and that's what we get. Uh, and then that's the gusset that goes underneath that brace. That is correct. Cool. But because we want the full chassis grab, I know that that ends here. And, right. So the chassis is this wide. Chassis is this wide, mm -hmm. but the motor mount ends there. So we're going to cut this back to that. It'll all make sense in the end. Another thing I noticed in the YouTube channels is, uh, some people critique others for stop working so fast. Well, I think everybody's trying to keep it interesting and get something accomplished because fabrication takes a long time. It's not like right now. So yeah, you see me moving quickly too because I'm trying to trying to keep an audience She's traced bad. inside. So see, like that. Hmm. Pretty clean, huh? I was thinking I could uh, shorten this. I think I'm going to. See how the steel's hanging off past the edge of that motor mount? See, you got about a full finger in there, right? Yeah. So I'm going to bring this up just a bit, and then when I pull the engine back out, I'll cut this off. So let me get the marker. And that'll actually let me put this piece on the size steel I have. I'm starting to think about the steel size that I actually have, and this template is just a little bit big for that. So I'm thinking if that was to cut to here, Right, and then that down to there. These are real world problems, albeit first world problems. Look, now I can use the steel. I'm not worried about that little corner because I'll fill that with a weld, no problem. Bada bing, bada boom. All right, I'm gonna check this to the other mount. Yeah, see, that's what I was thinking. It's a different arrangement. Very close, but uh, we have to make our own template for that one. And then back here. Yeah, that's going to be its own, too. So this can go in the trash. Oh, wow. I'd also like to thank the viewer that sent in this pile of cutting discs. Because I forgot to order, and we got in a pinch, so... Yeah, somebody send us the cheapy ones, but they still work. And I noticed your t-shirt. I don't have my glasses. Can you read that? Oh, Chuck Tuna, 2023. Chuck, Chuck Tuna. Yeah, he made that art and sent that to you. <laughs> Very cool. Yep, just like that. Cool. Get that welder. Set it up. That's all set, so I'm going to make the same thing here. Get that steering out of the way. So, same idea. I'm going to trace from the inside. Yeah, cool. I'm just going to take that little corner off. Little nip right there. Yes.
All right, everything is about the mock-up and fit-up. So I wouldn't drive the Jeep with the engine mounts just set like that, but it'll support the weight. There it is, supporting the weight. You wanna see how this head and then the intake and the height of the carburetor affect the hood. Mm-hmm. Valve cover ain't even on yet. Well, there's your problem right there. Yeah, that's the tell right there. We're gonna have to raise it. Go grab the intake manifold and the carburetor. Where does the intake go? I'm all screwed up. I'm so used to other engines. See this, that's the exhaust manifold. The carburetor goes right on top of the head. There is no intake manifold. <laughs> This thing is like a tractor. I mentioned earlier that it's like with the uh, intake being in the head, there is no intake manifold. The carburetor goes on right there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Pile O stuff. Got a hole saw. No. I thought I saw in the comments somebody said that there's a way you can adapt the engine. So Someone said you lower. can use a carburetor. Someone said a different Ford carburetor. Because I could see this valve cover just working. I mean, this little seam. Right. No problem. We could take that out for, to get the valve cover to go. Right. So maybe we'll, let's look into that. Because, uh, Body lift, I don't want to, but I saw that we have no body mount bushings or anything right now. So, I mean, a one inch, give a little room for this valve cover, I, I'd be okay with that. So, yeah, I'd say uh, here we have rolling chassis with an engine. I'm going to yank this back out and finish these engine mounts so I can get under there and not bang into an engine block. but. We're that much closer. How do you feel? I like it. I want to know what the solution is well, for this. Let's look into the carburetor choices. I think, I mean, the high hood's a great thing, but why cut the whole Jeep apart if we can just swap the carb? I know. Like, we're that, just like with the engines, it's like, why are we going to take the whole thing apart? Yeah. So, I, I, I really want to keep this body intact. And we could look back through the comments, but if you, whoever mentioned that is watching, please type it in these comments and we'll look for that carburetor, whether we need to make an adapter, somebody even said a side draft, anything goes, as long as it's available and has parts to rebuild or repair it. Because this will work. Can definitely make that valve yeah. cover go. That's what I thought. And I was like, ooh, we're in the clear. And then you stuck that thing on there. Yeah, and a lot of people said that. Valve cover will just sneak in. Carburetor will not. See, that's darn close. We could we could clearance that. So Ooh. come on, that'll work.